Um, yes. There was some. Um, there's an old rumour that um, William Randolph Hearst, the newspaper magnate in America, uh, was so incensed with Orson Welles that he hired a man to follow Welles for the rest of his life to create bad press and basically mash up his entire career from behind the scenes. Uh, it's a rumour, it's never been proved. Uh, Wells's career had, the, had a, a very nasty habit of sort of turning ill at the, at the greatest opportunity. And I think there's a rather interesting comparison there with Alistair Crowley, who whenever his head emerges, he tends to get uh, hit by a seagull or something larger, both in his lifetime and since. And um, in fact, Crowley himself referred to this in a letter he wrote uh, during the bankruptcy proceedings in 1934. And he said, I believe that somebody is out to get me. And uh, he referred to a, a famous publisher at the time, Isidore Ostra, who had made a deal for Crowley articles for a paper called The Sunday Referee. And uh, just as the, as the whole thing was signed, and it looked like Crowley's career in the 1930s in England might get on a more or less uh, even keel, Ostra, uh, with no reason at all, uh, cancelled the contracts and he was sort of left broke again. And his being broke is one of the things that Crowley's opponents and those who have written to him, uh, written about him, have, have continually referred to as if it's some sort of crime uh, to, to be unemployed, even though you're in fact one of the most hardest working people as he was. He had a kind of puritanical desire to work. Uh, but however he worked, uh, money was always very hard to come by, so his career was uh, incredibly fraught. Now, this persecution, um, which is evident when you study Crowley's life, uh, is especially later life, seems to continue to this day in a, in a strange sort of way. And, uh, and one's got to ask the question, why was Crowley, why is Crowley so vilified? Um, I remember a former owner of this shop who didn't want Crowley on the premises. Uh, mm. it, it was just, it might upset some people that uh, Crowley's books uh, were not really a tasteful uh, magical substance. Um, whereas, you know, if I'd, if, for example, if I'd written a book about Adolf Hitler, who we know murdered millions, uh, there doesn't seem to be too much of a problem like that. Reviews of Hitler's life are passed unnoticed. People. Uh, critics debate whether the evidence is reasonable or etc. 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 But you can say what you like. But uh, there seems uh, Crowley seems to be an extraordinary class of his own. That even though he's been dead uh, over 60 years, uh, it's almost discouraged to write or feel or have intelligent comments about Crowley at all. And um, who were his enemies? I mean, can we find out why he's vilified by having a look at that perhaps? Well, we're never quite sure who uh, Crowley's enemies were, because they very rarely came out of the woodwork, is often the case. But we, knew, we do know that the first people who opposed him very directly was the Cambridge Intercollegiate Christian Union, uh, who very much uh, objected to him turning up at his old college, Trinity, which he had every right to visit, and uh, talking to students at the, at the Rational uh, Association about free thought. And they objected to that. They objected to the fact he stood up for... He supported the Pan Society, who were interested in the influence of pagan religion on poetry. And that was, appears to be where his first opposition came out. Out of that, there was then further opposition from Horatio Bottomley, who was a corrupt MP who ran a paper called John Bull, hiding very much behind the, uh, the flag of patriotism. And things sort of got worse from there. His other enemies, we can say, were some Freemasons, but by no means all, some Theosophists, uh, really had it in for Crowley. They didn't like the fact that he didn't think that Madame Blavatsky was the, the, the answer to all the world's uh, spiritual problems. You could say the fascist wing of the Roman Catholic Church in the 1930s uh, was very much opposed to Crowley and re regarded him as a, as a dangerous Satanist about to subvert uh, the moral welfare of the planet, uh, if not further. And uh, today I suppose you'd have to say that there's some people of the liberal left would find Crowley very unacceptable because they find him a little too tough and they wouldn't like the fact that he always claimed to be a high Tory and Jacobite. Uh, if you know what high Tory and Jacobite means, if you don't, I suggest you look it up because it might be enlightened. Um, now it's odd, I think, that um, a man that's so dangerous that you're not supposed to write sensibly or intelligently or in a balanced way about him is yet dismissed in the press today when they're not telling you, as the Daily Express was 
a couple of weeks ago that he's one of the no most notorious criminals of the 20th century. This is a man, by the way, who's never charged with a serious crime in his life in many countries that he travelled through. Never charged with a serious crime. They can't get him on that one, so they, you get the, the whole uh, bucket of, of uh, uh, invective that's uh, uh, thrown at him regularly. Um, but failing that, they then start to say things like, well, he was a buffoon, he was a fool, he was a windbag. His ideas were baloney, uh, he stood up for uh, things that, that, that no sensible person who lives in a large thatched cottage in Wiltshire would ever stand for, for fear that their friends might never invite them to dinner again. And the days of wine and, and roses may be over. Um, given all this, it's rather amazing that I heard of him at all. I went up to Oxford in 1978 as an ordinand uh, candidate for the Church of England, and um, my hobby was mountaineering at the time. And it is odd that it's through mountaineering that I first heard of Alistair Crowley. I, uh, we were, I'd been climbing. Um, Chris Bonington had given a talk about uh, that Crowley was one of his his heroes as a mountaineer, and I was very interested in this because I was interested in the co combination of climbing and poetry and trying to go further than the, than, than, than the average uh, achievement. Um, I do not think that British education is, is a pinnacle of excellence. I think if you want a pinnacle of excellence, you have to exceed the norm, not uh, attain it. Um, so I, I heard about him at, at Oxford and I was very interested and as always happens with anyone's interest in Crowley, coincidences immediately start to occur. Turned out my, my new best friend just happened to be reading Crowley's Confessions, probably his greatest literary work, uh, currently available in, 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 in a, a rather, well, edited version, but a better version is coming forth. But it's a, it's a magnificent work, uh, Crowley's Confessions. I took that away, read it and was t deeply impressed and couldn't understand why this man wasn't world famous wasn't well known, and why Peter O'Toole hadn't played him in a movie by <laughs> David Lean. Seemed extraordinary. Why had we never heard of this man? It was incredible. Um, anyway, I found him quite influential. Uh, my tutors at Oxford studying theology thought that I'd uh, taken the wrong course <laughs> altogether. Um, but I persisted, and the end result of that was in 1980, I put on a play at Balliol called Ipsissimus, and, uh, which was about this whole thing about transcending the human condition. Now I remember going to the, uh, the, the provost of Balliol and saying, he said, um, what's this play about? I said, it's about the transcendence of the human condition. He said, that's very interesting, but does it have any nudity in it? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it didn't, I'm afraid to say. Um, anyway, I became quite well known at the time as being interested in this dangerous personality. And an odd thing happened 15 years later. Uh, an old uh, friend from college rang me up, I hadn't spoken to him for 15 years, he rang me up when I was living in, 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 the, in the north of England, and he said, oh, I'm coming up to work where you are. I said, that's great, I'd love to see you, you know, long time no see. He said, oh, uh, by the way, you, um, do you still think Alistair Crowley's uh, sort of all right? I said, yes, I do, yes, yes, I think he's all right, yes. Oh, right, okay, and I never heard from him again. <laughs> um, but I, I suspect he had um, uh, evangelical interests. <sighs> Um, which was a shame because it would be so nice to discuss it. It's clearly some sort of fear was at work here. Now, there are all kinds of fear, and Crowley seems to touch on, on most of them, but the most fundamental we know of is there's the fear of the dark, uh, the fear of the future, the fear of man, what people will do to you, and of course the fear of God, which we're told is the beginning of all wisdom, so it should be entertained. Um, I find this odd because Crowley has very positive things to say about all these fears. Uh, that is the dark future man and God. Now, I hope that everybody here is, 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 is at least either is or wants to be a brave spirit and will not swallow the great fear pill that has been administered since the early 20th century with regard to this extraordinary man, Alistair Crowley, which is my privilege to write about. And um, it seems to me that for anyone to grasp Crowley and enjoy him and, and make the best of his legacy, scattered as it, as it is about his life, because he did live rather like Orson Welles, as a kind of gypsy, writing on, on, on the hoof, and uh, seldom in a place of security for very long. Um, he needs a brave age. I think, I think we, we know that there has been a slightly brave age, uh, perhaps we, more than a in, merely insolent age, was the 1960s, when Crowley, of course, burst through in, in his first sort of pop incarnation in that period and, and started to influence filmmakers, musicians, poets and, 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 uh, and, and hippies and, and witches and so on and so forth. 
I was very touched by this idea because I found a letter recently, which uh, is printed for the first time, I think, in the book, uh, where um, Crowley wrote a letter, an extraordinary letter, to Major Grady McMurtry, who was an American major at the time fighting just after D-Day, and he's, he's, he's working towards Germany with the army, and uh, Crowley wanted him to be the inheritor of his magical order, the OCO. And uh, he, he says to McMurtry, and this is only a few, few weeks after D-Day, and McMurtry's fighting real Germans, and Crowley's writing for Buckingham, and he says, in the midst of this letter, he says, I think 1965 will be a very important year in the growth of the child, the child being the aeon of Horus, the new age which, which Crowley believed uh, was, was an inevitability. And I, I think that's an extraordinary thing, to actually pinpoint the year when Rubber Soul came out, the real dividing year between... Uh, Mary Quant and, and, and the oblivion that, that, that many people feel we've entered into since. So, um, so I wonder whether a lot of this fear has to do with, uh, with what I, I'd call um, the fear of revolution, but not, not the revolution that puts barricades up and uh, uh, quotes Marx, but really a spiritual revolution. Do, is it intuited that Alistair Crowley wanted to trans aeonify? The world uh, produce a completely not produce but to encourage a completely different kind of world order. Uh, I don't know, but it, it might be the reason why some people to this day are very dedicated to to uh, making him appear irrelevant. <coughs> um, my qualification for writing about Crowley uh, could be judged on many levels, but my favourite the, and perhaps the only true qualification is that I last uh, was it last year or the year before. The year before last, no, it was last year. Last year, I went to um, the house of Crowley's friend, Gerald York, who died in, in 1984, but his son, John York, is still there. And in, in, the, in the course of the conversation, and uh, I, I was, suddenly, I was thrown an object right towards him, and I grabbed it as it came to me, and it was Crowley's bronze wand, a Janus-headed, very interesting shape. And uh, John York said to me, he said, um, do you feel anything? I said, uh, Oh, very fine, thanks very much. Said, uh, some, some people said, uh, feel a frisson when they hold this, uh, to which I replied, well, it's all in the mind, isn't it? And uh, oddly enough, I found out through a recent book of Gerald York that this was a sort of test at Forthampton Court, Gloucestershire, for whether the person being uh, it turned up was, was, was slightly unstable or not. <laughs> so I, 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 that's my qualification. Um, now, I wanted... Uh, the whole point of my book was to give Crowley his voice, because I... I you know, people must come to their own own judgment about about Alistair Crowley. My mother, who read the confessions for me while I was writing the book, um, said she thought he was a wonderful person, liked his company very much, uh, but she wasn't interested in the magic. And I thought that was very interesting. But she responded to him as as an individual with a, a high intelligence and great perception. Um, so, whichever, wherever anyone stands on this, he's an extraordinary human being, and I wanted to present him more fully than I think has ever do been done before. And I wanted to give him his voice. And uh, I, at which point I wanted to read you my favourite Crowley poem in, in my version of Crowley's voice. But um, <coughs> if I can remember what page it's on in the book, uh, if you'd like. Let's have a look. Crowley was in Spain when he wrote this poem. It's called La Gitana. And uh, Gitana is a Spanish gypsy girl. And the, you'll hear the expression, it my salia. And the salia is an Indian female devotee of Shiva. And if you know anything about Shiva worship, you'll know what it is that the devotee wants to get to grips with. <laughs> so if you'll forgive this impersonation. <clears throat> Your hair was full of roses in the dew fall as we danced. The sorceress enchanting and the paladin entranced. In the starlight as he wove us in a web of silk and steel, immemorial as the marvel in the halls of Boabdil. In the pleasance of the roses with the fountains and the yews, where the snowy shower soothed us with the breezes and the dews. In the starlight as we trembled from a laugh to a caress, and the god came warm upon us in our pagan allegress. Was the Bai de la Bona too seductive? Did you feel through the silence and the softness all the tension and the steel? For your hair was full of roses and my flesh was full of thorns and the midnight came upon worth a million crazy morns 
Ah, my gypsy, my gitana, my salia, were you fain for the dance to turn to earnest? Oh, the sunny land of Spain. My gitana, my salia, more delicious than a dove, with your hair aflame with roses and your lips alight with love. Shall I see you? Shall I kiss you once again? I wander far from the sunny land of summer to the icy polar star. I shall find you. I shall have you. I am coming back again from the filth and fog to seek you in the sunny land of Spain. I shall find you, my gitana, my salir as of old, with your hair aflame with roses and your body gay with gold. I shall find you. I shall have you in the summer in the south, with our passion in your body and our love upon your mouth. With our wonder and our worship, be the world aflame anew. My gitana, my salir, I am coming back to you. <laughs> Uh, they say he's a lousy poet. I can't agree. No. Any questions? <laughs> well, How long did you spend writing the book? This four... And researching. Ah, research. Well, you could say the research started 31 years yeah, ago. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, research in earnest. There was a period in 1991-92 when I first went to the Warburg Institute and became acquainted with the, uh, the collection, the York Collection and uh, made a great deal of progress. Then I was thinking of making a film at the time, and that, that didn't happen, as so many films on Crowley don't happen. Yeah. Uh, but then I was commissioned four years ago by, uh, by Mark Booth. He said he thought that Crowley was going to be big. Well, Crowley is big. But he thought <laughs> people were going to realize that Crowley was big. And uh, I, I worked probably harder on this particular book than any other I've ever, ever done. So. Between well, four and thirty-one years, with the answer to that question. I just let you know. I just started reading it, and uh, I can't wait to get back to it. Great, really, <laughs> great. very good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. It's not interest. Does he have any relatives still alive? Sorry, I can't hear. Does Alistair Crowley have any relatives still alive? Oh yes, indeed. Yes, his his uh, his okay. daughter his daughter is still alive in America, oh. and uh, th therefore his gra his grandson is still alive in America. Is a Jazz musician, yes, indeed. And on the other side of his family, the the, the Crowleys of, of Alton, they're alive and, and well in the south of England. Though they're rather uh, they're separate from Crowley's side of the family. And is it is it a true fact that he actually has rumours that he worked for MI6? Is, is it a true fact that he worked for MI6? Like uh, I in the book I show all the evidence that is available. To suggest strongly that that he was of use to to some members of MI6 at certain times, I would describe Crowley's uh, role in intelligence as a freelance intelligence <coughs> asset, not a paid agent. But he was, you know, he when he went to Cambridge, his aim was yeah. to become a diplomat, a high diplomat, and he went to Russia to study uh, Russian and acquaint himself with the intrigue. Now Crowley.